This is level two of the CFA program, topic on equity evaluation, and the reading on industry and company analysis. This reading was written by three professionals, each of whom holds the CFA designation. And I particularly enjoyed this reading because it gives what I always say is a good big picture analysis of what we're trying to do as financial analysts. Not to say that it doesn't go into great detail because there's lots of good detail and you'll see that as we go through some of the slide deck today. But let me tell you what I mean just quickly before we look at the LOSs here. Now this is a particular emphasis in level three. Of course, we get some of it in level one and some more of it in level two. But as a good financial analyst, this is pretty much, uh, this is pretty much the challenge that, that we face. Let me give you a quick example. Let's suppose that I'm a client and I come to you and I have a bunch of money. And I say, here's all my money. I don't have any idea what to do with it. Here are my return and risk objectives and all of my uh, constraints. Of course, you, you help uh, compute all of those things. And it's your job then to find the best financial securities and maybe physical uh, assets to help me meet my risk and return objectives. And so what you do is you start with the big picture. You start with a macroeconomic analysis, then you move to industry analysis, and then you move to individual company analysis. Of course, that's the top-down approach, and we could reverse that trend into the bottom-up approach. And that's pretty much the focus of this reading. And uh, the authors do a really good job of blending the company analysis and industry analysis in what I believe is almost like an introductory chapter because what we're going to do in the next couple of readings is we're going to do lots and lots of math. Not a whole lot of math in, in this reading. As you can see, there's lots of compares and evaluates. Uh, let me point your attention to somewhere in the bottom middle. There's one called judge the competitive position. I don't remember seeing that action word, but I love that. And notice it's Porter's Five Forces. We did that in a previous recording. And so I'm a big fan of combining uh, LOSs that are in multiple readings. All right, let's go ahead and start with what I just suggested a few moments ago, this, this top-down approach. Notice what we're going to do. We're going to pick some macroeconomic variable, and it's most likely going to be uh, gross domestic product, probably real GDP. We're going to begin at the level of the overall economy. So think of the economy as like, uh, like a big old circle. All right, so this is what we're doing. We're going to say, all right, what does this big old circle inside of a specific country's economy look like? And so all we do is add up all the economic activity that goes on inside of that economy and we get, uh, we get GDP. So then what we do is that we break this big old circle into its little parts. Maybe it's a sector, maybe it's an industry. And if, if we believe that the economy is gonna grow by, let, let's pick a number, say 5%. And then we go and look at each of these individual industries or sectors inside of the economy. And of course, some, some industries are gonna grow by more than that 5%. Some are gonna grow by less than that 5%. And some might even be expected to contract. So the goal then is to find those industries, right, that are gonna have the most or the highest expected growth levels. And then inside of those high growth industries, we find the best firms that are gonna match my, remember I'm Jim the client, they're gonna match my risk and return objectives. And so inside of all of that, and you'll see this in a bunch of these LOSs, is that we wanna predict stuff that's on the income statement for a company analysis. So we start with revenues and then we're gonna move on to expenses and we get net income and then we're gonna move that over to the balance sheet. So there's a part of this reading that is gonna rely on our ability to retain the accounting material that we've known from our undergraduate days and then our level one and then our level two days. So look at this little chart here, begin at the level of the overall economy, then move to those individual industries, and then we go to individual companies or, or just individual product markets. And then we move over to arrive at a revenue projection for the individual company. 
Now we can do this a couple of different ways here. So let's go ahead and look at this growth relative to GDP growth approach. So think about this. Here's our GDP. What did I say? 5%. So we need to figure out what's happening inside of each of those industries and then what's happening inside of each of those companies. So let's go through that flow chart just quickly. So forecast uh, nominal GDP growth rate, then estimate industry growth relative to that macroeconomic growth rate, and then use that industry growth to help identify and estimate company growth rates. And then, of course, we need to worry about inflation. So we'll go ahead and say, all right, what is real GDP? What is inflation? And then we'll try to monitor the difference between our nominal GDP growth rate estimate and our real GDP growth rate estimate. And we'll use the combination of those two to forecast the revenues for a particular company. And there are two suggestions inside of the reading, and these are just simple math. We could just say something like, hey, uh, we believe that the company sales for, what did I say? I'm Jim's, Jim's Baking Company. That Jim's Baking Company, it, his revenues are going to be GDP plus 100 or 200 or 300 basis points, something like that. Or we can just compound and use the one plus uh, some kind of a growth rate. Either way, mathematically is acceptable. Now, how about if we look at market share and market growth? So what we're going to do is we're going to forecast growth in these relevant markets, right? So we have, so think about here, here's the big old economy, and we have all of these individual industries and then markets inside of those industries. And then we're going to look at Jim's baking company and say, all right, well, what can Jim do? If the overall baking market is, let's just say it's 100, what can Jim capture? You know, maybe last year Jim was, Jim had 10% uh, of the market share, but during the course of this year, Jim did, oh, advances in technology. He hired some really smart men and women who are going to generate uh, lots and lots of extra marginal revenues and et cetera, et cetera. So what is Jim's growth rate going to be in relation to the overall growth rate? And of course, we're going to incorporate that into the forecast, and then we're, we're going to forecast the company's revenues. And you can use that simple gray boxed equation down there at the bottom or, or others that are similar as well. So notice what we've done. We've done the, the top down. So here we are, the rain cloud and the top down. We're getting all the way to the bottom and right on right on the earth is Jim's baking company. Now we're going to do the bottom up approach. So we're going to start with Jim's baking company and then we're going to say, all right, Jim gets, let's say, uh, 10 percent of that market share or increase in assets or increase in revenues or increase in net income or cash flow however you want to identify it. and then we're going to look up and see all right well here are jim's main competitors and here are some tertiary competitors out here so look at that middle circle point there aggregating the projections for the individual company or the unit so that we can go then and make an estimate for the entire product line and then the industry. So we're bottom upping to get all the way up to the top of that rain cloud. And you can do this with time series. You can do return on capital or you can do some kind of uh, capacity based measures. Now, notice we went like this and then we went like this. But what lots of people view those two approaches concerning their weaknesses. And each one has some steps in there where the analyst is going to have to make some assumptions. And so to try to avoid making some uh, incorrect assumptions and maybe some uh, substantial errors, a hybrid approach is used. And of course, this simply means that what's going to happen is that we're going to take elements of top down, we're going to take elements of the bottom up, and we're going to meet somewhere in the middle. So think about it this way, just in a simple sense. You know, we start up here with a rain cloud and we look at the overall economy and we look at Jim's baking company down here, one company. And so somehow we're going to jump into the middle. And in the uh, in the box on the right, you know, there's a, there's one way to do this. 
Uh, the reading does mention that uh, this is the most commonly used, and I'm guessing it's uh, it's probably a product of the simple fact that you know you have a lot of different individuals inside of this working group, and the working group is going to have all these different personalities, and somebody's going to say, "Hey, let's do it this way," and someone's going to say, "Hey, do it this way," and so it's kind of a compromise. That's what I, that's the way I think of this. All right, so what do we just do? We we decided on multiple ways of coming what coming up with an estimate for revenues. Well, what comes after revenues? We have to do all these operating costs. So let's go ahead and continue our way down the balance sheet so that we can put together these financial statements and make a judgment on whether or not a particular company or a particular industry is over or undervalued. And so these are very similar to what we just described. So this top-down approach, we're going to look at, you know, here's the rain clouds and the rain clouds come down. The first thing that you think about are the input prices, right? The input costs. So if I'm Jim's Bakery, what do I, what do I have to buy? I have to buy wheat and I have to buy flour and I have to buy corn and I have to buy sugar and I probably have to buy some chocolate, right, and caramel. I got to put all that stuff into my donuts and my cookies and whatever else that I make. So we need, to do, we need to worry about inflation. All right, so we start with overall inflation. But now remember that overall inflation is going to include things like, you know, the pharmaceutical industry and the energy industry, which may have absolutely nothing to do with Jim's Baking Company's input costs. But nevertheless, we need to start out with that and then work our way down. We're narrowing it all the way down to Jim's Baking Company until we get into, well, essentially it's, uh, you know, commodity price risk, inflation in the commodity market. On the other hand, we could start with Jim and we could say, okay, wheat and corn and, and sugar and chocolate, and then we could move up and say, all right, what are Jim's competitors? And then we have a Jim's competitor. Maybe we have uh, Jenny's Baking Company over here. And not only does she do donuts and cupcakes, but but she does uh, wedding cakes and she does potato chips and she does other other kinds of baking. So there's a little bit additional element of different kinds of input prices and different kinds of inflation. And then we expand that to include, you know, maybe all manufacturers. And then we have to worry about inputs to, you know, steel prices and um, climate change and all those kinds of things. All right. So top down, bottom up. And then, of course, somewhere in the middle is hybrid. But I think the interesting part of this element of th this LOS is the relationship between whether we're doing bottom up or top down, we need to worry about inflation. So somehow in here, inflation is probably going to be a key component to a question. So we need to think about the difference between fixed costs and variable costs. The fixed costs, of course, are those things that are mostly things like electricity and equipment and all those kinds of overhead fixed costs that are typically not directly tied to revenues versus costs, variable costs that are directly tied to revenues. So notice that LOS asks us to evaluate whether economies of scale are present by, analing op by analyzing operating margins and sales levels. All right, so that's what we need to do here. Factors that lead to economies of scale greater bargaining power with suppliers, right? If I'm, if I have a great relationship with all of the farmers in the area, remember I'm Jim's baking company, I can say, okay, you know what? Uh, I'm going to buy your corn because I love your corn, but I, I got people way over here in another county and they're dying to send me some corn. And if I love your corn and I, boy, I want to use your corn, but the corn over there is probably just as good. And if they're going to be willing to sell to me at a lower price, uh, you know, I really want to stay with you. How about lower cost of capital? You know, this goes back to Medigliani and Miller uh, in 1958. Lower cost of capital will automatically lead to uh, economies of scale. And then in particular, especially from, you know, kind of this bottom up approach or uh, or or maybe the hybrid approach, lower per unit marketing expenses. Of course, what we want to do is we want to hire somebody and have them be a part of our marketing strategy. And then we want to leverage that investment in marketing to, to 
higher revenues, and then we can spread out those marketing costs over greater units. I think our bolded comment down there in the bottom box probably sounds like a really good answer to a, a question. Gross and operating margins. So remember that both, both gross and operating margins are positively correlated with sales levels in an industry that enjoys economies of scale. So look at that LOS. Evaluate whether economies of scale. So look for, look for a sentence in the vignette that gives you that positive correlation. Uh, here's a good here's a good LOS forecast the following. So we have a bunch of these costs that we're going to have to forecast. And so we're, we're thinking that, boy, wouldn't it be great if we were accounting experts and all this stuff would come to us uh, just instantaneously. And hopefully as you're reading through level one, level two, you're becoming more, more of an accountant. So as I show you these next couple of slides, these make, uh, these make perfect sense. All right. So what's important about cost of goods sold? Largest com component for manufacturing and merchandising companies. So look at that second arrow point, the indented arrow point. A small error leads to a large error in forecasting operating profit, right? So we have these great sensitivities, dare I even call it some type of an elasticity. So we need to make sure that if we use the historical cost of goods sold as a base for our forecast, that we're aware that these small errors or changes, are you ready for this? Changes in the macro economy, changes in the industry, changes in the product market, changes in our individual company, right? The, of cost of goods sold could lead to substantial errors. All right, so there's a, two good old formulas there at the bottom in gray that you can use to forecast cost of goods sold as a percent of revenue and as a gross profit margin. Now, here's another answer to a question. Look at this. Cost of goods sold are inversely related to gross margin. So just let me go back here. So what did I say back here? Ah, we have this positively correlated with sales levels here, inversely related to... Uh, gross margin. Look at that second arrow point. Decreasing cost of goods sold as a percent of sales implies, implies higher gross margins, right? That makes sense. Meaning that the company is gaining market share. And that must mean, that doesn't automatically mean, but it probably means that there are some economies of scale at work. Now look at the last arrow point there. Use competitors' gross margins to make sure that we're in line with all of the competition out there. And so this is standard fare. I tell my students all the time, whenever they're doing financial statement analysis, to go ahead and look at the trend, right? That's important. But then go ahead and look at what the competition is doing. And if we're way up here and the competition is way down here, then we're either superior or, in, or inferior, depending on you know, what the ratio is telling us. Now, let's not forget that third arrow point. Look out for the impact of a company's hedging strategy. And this is, you know, uh, this is interesting because the reading suggests something like this. We need to be aware of it. But the reading specifically says something like, and I'm paraphrasing here, that lots of companies don't come right out and say, oh, this is our hedging strategy and these are the derivative contracts that we use. Now, of course, you can look at the financial statements and you can see some information about the hedging instruments, but you can't get a complete set of information as a financial analyst looking at publicly available financial statements. But you can, you can infer, you can extract information about a company's hedging strategy. Like, for example, Jim's Baking Company. I mean, what am I going to do? I mean, there's no doubt that I'm going to use either a forward contract with the farmers or a futures contract on some exchange to hedge my input prices. Because if I think the price of corn is gonna dramatically increase, well, then I wanna use that forward or that futures contract to lock in a price. I might even use swap contracts. I might even use option contracts. Remember now, option contracts, they're beautiful, right? Uh, they give you the right, but not the obligation to trade. And that's beautiful. We would always like to use an option, but of course, uh, unlike futures contracts and forward contracts, options come with a cost and that cost can be substantial. And so lots of firms just use, you know, capital budgeting, net present value analysis. Should I use the option or should I use the futures contract? So the point of this third arrow 
is that what we want to do, all right, so we're forecasting these, but we want to make sure that we're aware of a company's hedging strategy. So are you ready for this? So a company that hedges, hold on, a company that doesn't hedge might have something that look like this, right? If I'm paying lots and lots for corn and wheat, and then I'm paying a little for corn and wheat, and then lots, all right, but if we hedge, what are we doing? We're making it like this. So look for stability in those gross margins as a sign that a company that uses lots of commodities and also a company that uh, uses uh, steel or any other kind of a volatile input. You know, go back to uh, the early part of 2021. Lumber prices were about this big and then lumber prices a week later were, can you guys see my arms weighed out here? They were about this big. Moving on to selling general and administrative expenses. I think of these as kind of dull at least mostly dull, maybe the selling, maybe the distrib distribution expenses, maybe they're a little bit more interesting. Look at that fourth arrow point, selling and distribution expenses increase as sales increase. Uh, that makes sense, but the others are probably less variable. So look at the first arrow point. Uh, these SG&A expenses, they're uh, probably less closely linked to revenues than they are to cost of goods sold. Although there's a caveat there with that fourth, uh, with that fourth arrow point. Uh, how about the third arrow point? Different components uh, are often disclosed, so you can separate these and try to look at the trend and maybe look against the comp the competition. Again, there's that fourth, uh, fourth arrow. I'm sorry, the fifth arrow point. And then as from a definitional standpoint, it includes wages, uh, overhead, uh, research and development. That makes sense. Uh, Non-operating costs, you guys know what these are. Interest uh, income, interest expense, taxes, uh, all those other things. Um, these are probably super important if we're evaluating the banking industry or a particular financial institution, but less for Jim's baking company. Although, you know, of course, it depends on the amount of debt that I have in my capital structure, which leads right into financing expenses. Uh, the last part of this LOS, income taxes. So we know this from previous recordings. Statutory tax rate, that's just the legal rate. Effective tax rate, that's, you know, kind of an accounting way to say, okay, what's the ratio of uh, taxes to, you know, total income or total revenues? And so here's the important one. Look at that second diamond point there. Effective tax rate is used to forecast net income. Cash tax rate is used to forecast cash flows. That sounds like a, a likely question. All right, so what have we done so far? We've taken a look at the income statement for a company. We have forecasted an income statement. Whether we use top down or bottom up or some hybrid approach, you know, what we're doing is we're taking, you ready for this? We're taking macroeconomic variables and firm specific variables to put together a forecasted income statement, right? So what's the goal of the business? Maximize shareholder wealth. Uh, the firm does this lots and lots of different ways. Of course, the primary way is to invest in projects that have positive net present values. But one of the mechanical ways to do that is to find product lines in which you can make something for pennies and sell it for dollars, right? So then what happens at the bottom of the income statement? So we model that income statement first, and then what do we do? We take that net income and we scooch it over to the bottom right hand side of the balance sheet because that represents the ownership of the business and that's income right it's income and we throw it into retained earnings we throw it into the equity and then of course we can pay out of retained earnings any dividends that we want uh, that our board wants to pay to our shareholders all right so let's look at some of these uh some of these colored a block point. So look at the purple one, items that flow directly from the income statement. So there's net income and we take out the dividends. So there's our uh, ultimate retained earnings. How about items that are linked to income statement projections? Of course, accounts, re accounts receivable depends entirely on sales, right? Uh, inventory depends entirely on 
how much we didn't sell, right? Beginning inventory and ending inventory. And then accounts payable, that has everything to do with the cost of all of our sales. You know, we have to pay other people out there, whatever those accounts payables are. And then financing or investment decisions. Of course, if I'm Jim's bakery, then what do I have to do? Sooner or later, I'm going to have to replace some of my ovens, replace some of my machinery, replace some of my assembly lines, whatever this is, replace some of my trucks and my airplanes or however I distribute my donuts and cupcakes. Uh, we can take a look at some efficiency ratios here to uh, evaluate the top portion of the balance sheet. What do we call that working capital? And so for an example, you can do a quick calculation for accounts receivable. And of course, you can do this from the bottom, uh, uh, the top down or the bottom up. Capital expenditures um, include, you ready for this? Investments in positive net present value projects. The reading says growth, capital expenditures needed to expand the business. And then we also have to, uh, we have to maintain all of our machinery and equipment. Uh, how about forecasting a company's future capital structure? So what do we need for this? We need market values of our debt and equity. And so from those, we can, we can compute some debt to equity ratios or debt to uh, EBIT DA or any other kind of leverage ratio. And we can say, okay, this is where we are. Uh, this is where we want to be. Remember that great uh, beginning point of Medigliani and Miller where they taught us that capital structure doesn't matter. But then when you add things like taxes and bankruptcy costs and financial distress costs, we have this target capital structure. So of course, an estimate, what is that, that second left-hand teardrop point? Forecast a company's future capital structure. So what we're trying to do is move to the optimal capital structure, which is a function of historical practice, management, and the board of directors' uh, strategic plan, and then all of the capital requirements for those capital expenditures. So make sure that you uh, view the link between required or expected or hoped for capital expenditures and the need for capital structure, right? Maybe we're going to have to issue some bonds. Maybe we're going to have to issue some shares of stock. Uh, return on invested capital. This is pretty much a standard measure of profitability. And so there's the good old equation. You've probably seen that a hundred times before. Um, what's important is to be able to address that LOS. So it's not really calculate the return on invested capital. But, you know, let's figure out how we can look at the trend line in this measure, compare it to the benchmark of our competitors, and how can we determine if we have a competitive advantage. So look at that first diamond point. High and persistent levels of this metric are usually associated with a competitive advantage. It's unaffected by financial leverage. So it might provide a better description of return than just simple ROE. It might. And so my advice to students all the time is go ahead and calculate both of them and decide which one's more appropriate. Now, the reading does suggest that this provides a better description of profitability. Uh, we talked about these Porter's five forces in a previous reading. So here's that LOS, judge the competitive position. So I love this. If I'm writing a question, I'm going to say, all right, here's a company, Jim's Baking Company, and here's its condition in these five forces, right? Threat of substitutes, rivalry, bargaining power, customer power, the threat of new entrants. So look at, you know, uh, uh, three and four, I think about that as the uh, supply chain on both sides. You know, we got it over here and we have it over here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say something like in this vignette that Jim's Baking Company, it does really well because um, there are no substitutes for Jim's Donut, right? I'm making that up. Rivalry, you know, Jim is the dominant market position and uh, there's no way that there's a competitive firms out there that can match his 
pricing power and his fragments and, and high fixed costs, et cetera, et cetera. And then supply chain and the threat of new entrants. All right, so you, 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 know, you get a sense here that what will happen is that in the vignette, there might be, there might be four of these are, that are positive forces and one that might be a negative force for this competitive position. And so the answer is going to be, hey, Jim looks great with the exception of this. And that would be the answer on the, on the exam. Yeah, whenever we make forecasts on the income statement, I said this earlier, we have to worry about inflation or deflation, right? If I'm Jim's baking company, I have to worry about all of my input prices rising. And then, well, if I'm paying more for corn and more for sugar and more for chocolate, I make this donut and this donut costs 50 cents and it costs 50 cents for the last couple of years. But all of a sudden there's a spike in all of these commodity prices well, what can I do? Well, the first thing I might be tempted to do is shrink the size of my donut by whatever is the, the extra input price, right? So I'm still selling that donut for 50 cents. But sooner or later, you know, you can only shrink a donut until it gets down to, you know, just the donut hole, right? And no one's going to buy just a piece of air. So the question then becomes, can I convince my customers that, hey, my costs are rising. I need to pass this on to you. And it's not gonna affect my profitability. It's not like I'm trying to charge a higher, higher price so that I can go out and buy another beach house. All right, there's a simple one here. Factors that influence a company's ability to pass inflation, right? So the industry structure. If I am making these donuts and lots and lots of people around me are making donuts and our prices rise together, then that's probably okay. Um, I, you know, this is so true, at least in our area, you know, we have, I don't know, five or six different convenience stores that sell, that sell self-serve gas. And I'm just amazed that the price of gas is identical throughout, uh, throughout our town. So industry structure means that you can pass those on. Price elast elasticity of demand. This is why we go through that microeconomics reading or two so that you can understand that, all right, if we increase our, our price by 1%, then we're going to have a decrease in our demand, our quantity demanded of, well, maybe it's 1%, maybe it's a half percent, maybe it's 10%. So price elasticity of demand is important. Um, different inflation rates, uh, not only, uh, I mean, if you look at Jim's Baking Company, inflation for corn and sugar and chocolate is probably the same inside this region or pretty close to it. But if we move to other parts of the country, you know, I'm on the East Coast, but if you go out to California, maybe, maybe the price of sugar is way higher out in California for a variety of reasons, and then extend that to uh, different countries. And then we go back to the board of directors and their strategic plan, which is going to then involve all the executives to coming up with a pricing strategy and market position. All right, I like this one here. Ways of mitigating the effects of volatility on input prices or input costs. All right, so let's let's go from the bottom up. Access to alternative inputs, right? If uh, the farmer comes to me and says, hey, hey Jim, the corn corn prices is going is super high so i make a corn donut well maybe maybe i'm going to say oh maybe i don't need to make a corn donut anymore maybe i can make a wheat donut or or a barley donut or whatever else it is so if i have alternative inputs then then uh, i probably have a greater chance of flattening or having the um, uh, stability in my inputs vertical integration i could just go i could just say hey to the farmer hey hey johnny or jenny farmer how about if i just buy your farm that way that way the farmer is me and i'm now jim's baker i'm jim's farmer and i'm jim's baking and so those uh that vertical integration allows me to manage the input prices. But of course, I'm probably not gonna go out and buy a farm. What I'm gonna do is what I said earlier, is I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, and use a forward contract or a futures contract or you know some other type of a derivative contract. 
All right, how about factors to consider when we're assessing inflation on all of those uh, accounts inside of the income statement. So geographic mix, that makes sense. Currency rates, that makes sense. Cost structure, whether we have lots of variable or lots of fixed, and then the company strategy. Uh, how about technological developments on demand, selling prices, costs, and margins? All right, so there are four things over there that, that we need to worry about. So think of me, Jim's Baking Company. So what did I used to do? You know, when I first started 100 years ago, I had my workers, right? They were, they were putting the flour and the corn together, and they were doing all this stuff, and they were making the donut by hand. But over time, I replaced all that with machinery. Not the machinery that you see in the Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator movies, but machinery so that uh, I can make the same donut and I don't have to worry about all of my workers having a bad day in, in mashing and doing whatever they're doing. So reducing the cost of production, increasing uh, profit margins, and expanding industry supply and sales. I mean, of course, that, that makes perfect sense. But then, of course, we need to worry about uh, cannibalizing um, our products. All right, how do we forecast accounting for technological development? This is going to make perfect sense, right? Start with the base year. Use alternative scenarios to forecast revenues, right? So we put together this Excel spreadsheet, and I love this alternative scenarios, right? We say, this is what I always tell, tell students, you know, let's look at a a best case scenario, a worst case scenario, and then a most likely scenario. Three of those scenarios is probably enough. And we're going to say, okay, the technology, what does this do? Is it going to increase my revenues by this much or this much? How about my cost? This much or this much? So analyzing the cost structure and projecting the costs and expenses. And then at the bottom of the spreadsheet, I can do net income and I can do uh, earnings per share. Now, of course, what we need here is an expert on the technological development, right? I'm Jim's Baker and I just, I've been doing this for a thousand years, but if there's some new kind of technology I, I don't know anything about, I have to hire somebody or I need to have somebody in my employ who knows about this technology, who's going to be able to say, you know what, Jim, you make a hundred donuts an hour with this new technology, you're going to be able to make 150 donuts an hour. And it's going to be because of this and this and this and this. And you put all that stuff into the Excel spreadsheet. Ah, it's one thing to go ahead and forecast for this particular quarter or this particular year, but what do we do if we're going to try uh, long-term forecasting? Keeping in mind that the farther we go out into the future, the less accurate our estimate or our forecast is going to be. So the first element here is to make certain that our forecast horizon is the same thing as our expected holding period as some type of an investor, whether it's a bondholder or a shareholder. All right, let's look at these factors. All right, so investment horizon, that makes sense. Uh, cyclicality of the industry, right? So what happens? We know the life cycle goes like this, it goes like this. Well, where are we in the life cycle? So if we're, if we're here, right, if we're on the downward trend, oh, this is a good time to get into this industry. We need to make sure of the timing. So if it goes from here to here, well, maybe that takes a week, probably not a week, but you know, maybe a quarter or, or maybe five years. So we need to know what that industry life cycle looks like. And then, of course, we need to look inside of the company and look at specific factors that are going to impact not only revenues and costs, but net income and operating cash flow. And that, of course, means looking at the balance sheet. Has there been changes on the right-hand side? Are there capital structure changes? Have I had acquisitions? Have I had divestitures? And then we can use some kind of a discounted cash flow model to come up with an estimate of value. Now, of course, when, once we get beyond that short-term horizon, we want to do we want to estimate some kind of a terminal value. You know, it doesn't make any sense to say, okay, we're going to do this for the next 20,000 years or through infinity. Let's go ahead and figure out a terminal value, which 
right terminal value can be considered you know like a future value of reinvested cash flows or it be or it can be considered as it is in this case uh, a present value of those long-term projections so we have the short-term horizon and then we have a terminal value and we can do this based uh, on things that we've talked about in past recordings we can use the multiples based approach or we can use the discounted cash flow technique Yeah, challenge in long-term forecasting. Yeah, this uh, this is a good one. Look at that dude over there with the binoculars. I always laugh at that when I see this. It reminds me of Chevy Chase in Fletch when he's when he's looking out the window and then he looks at the dude who uh, is trying to hire him to kill him. Anyway, Fletch, you guys weren't even born when Fletch was released. That's your homework assignment. Go watch Fletch. All right, so here's the problem. The problem is economic disruption, change in the business cycle, technology, government regulation. So there's a host of all of these unforeseen events. But let me go ahead and link something that we've talked about in previous recordings and some that we'll talk about in future recordings, right? These are events that occur way over here on the left-hand side of the tail. So maybe value at risk kind of a thought process is appropriate for, look at this, anticipating inflection points where the future will significantly differ from the recent past. So think about this challenge in long-term forecasting as no different than challenge in your long-term forecasting of your income levels, right? If I said to you, all right, tell me what you think you're going to make during the next six months. And you could probably come up with something that's relatively accurate. But if I say, tell me what you're gonna make 16 years from now, you'd probably scratch your head and say, well, Jim, uh, who knows? I mean, me, I'll be 75 years old in 16 years. Boy, hopefully I'm still alive by then. All right, so let's go ahead and look at this last one here. Let's build a model, constructing the pro forma income statement and then the balance sheet. So this is kind of a summary uh, illustration and flow chart of what we've been talking about since that very first slide. Get out your phone, take a picture of this. All right, so forecasting revenues, then we're gonna estimate costs, then we're gonna estimate financing costs, and then we're gonna forecast some expenses, put together the pro forma income statement. Right. And then we're going to take that net income from that pro forma income statement, throw it back over to the balance sheet. And we're going to forecast capital investments and depreciation, working capital, and then build the cash flow statement and the balance sheet. Of course, these are all expectations. These are forecasted models. So we call these pro forma cash flow and pro forma balance sheet. And I think that takes us through those LOSs. Um, boy, there's a lot of good stuff in here. Uh, my focus would be on the top down, bottom up and hybrid, the economies of scale, and then the balance sheet and income statement and cash flow uh, pro forma models.